Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast. Today, we have some corrections from some of our listeners, and we're going to start off with those before we get to the new questions and answers. So here is one from Blind Boy Johnny. He says, a brief correction. You said both of the uh, both the interlock and the Acubond were made by the same manufacturer. If I did, boy, was I ever wrong. <laughs> the interlock is made by Hornady. That's exactly right. And they do make and enter or an interbond, which is similar to the Nosler's Acubond. Otherwise, great information, and I love to listen to you, <laughs> even when I make mistakes. So you're absolutely right. These are both bonded core bullets, lead core bonded to the gilding metal jacket. The Nosler version is called the Acubond, and it's shaped a little bit differently from the Hornady Interbond. But they're both kind of classic bonded bullets. Thanks for the corrections there, blind boy. Um, this is Bob Johnson, and he, oh, he's actually asking a question. He's not correcting me. Hey, Ron, if you're shooting downhill or uphill at a 45-degree angle and it's a 600 yards to the target, what range should you aim at? I know the answer, but I'll bet many don't. Oh, boy. <laughs> what Bob is getting at here, of course, is, is your bullet going to stri strike higher or lower when you're shooting at steep angles or any angle, really? Because it does change things. And the answer, the easy answer is you always will end up shooting higher because the, the easiest way to understand this is horizontal distance. What we usually shoot at when we're zeroing at the range, shooting in flat country, gravity is pulling at a right angle to pull your bullet down. Well, when you slant that shot at the same distance, now the gravity is pulling that at an angle. So you're not getting the same degree of drop, even though you're still pulling your bullet with the same 32 feet per second that gravity pulls. So it doesn't really matter if it's down or up. You're still pulling at that different angle. And that's where it gets a little confusing. But trust me, I've tested it. I've researched it 24 ways to Sunday, and it's always going to be striking higher. The trick is how do you figure out which is which? <laughs> Bob's obviously figured it out one way or another. Classic way is with cosines, trigonometry, which like boo, exploded my brain back in high school. But it's not all that complicated. You just need to know the cosine number. And then you take that in uh, decimals like 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, whatever it is. Uh, at your, and then your range, say for 600 yards here, the cosine for 45 degrees, I believe it's seven, a little more than seven, maybe. So let's just say 0. 0.7 times six, 42. So that would be 420 yards equivalent. So the horizontal rifle to target distance would be 420 yards on the horizontal. That's how you have to figure your drop, not the 600 yards way up there at a 45 degree angle. That's pretty crazy. So the, the thing to, to learn with all this is those cosines in the country that you might be hunting and shooting at steep angles. But here's some good news. They're never as steep as we think they are. You look at a 15 degree slope and you think, whoa, that's like 30, 35 degrees. We always overestimate it, whether it's down or up. I was once teaching some classes in, in Colorado in some cliff country, and I'm talking vertical cliff. We had a devil of a time finding a target more than 200 yards away at more than a 45 degree angle. We hardly even found one that was suitable for a 45 degree angle. And when we walk up to the edge of those cliffs and look down, it is steep. But just the way the world works, there's usually some spill off from those slopes. And it's just hard to get out more than about 200 yards on a drop like that. So we ended up with, uh, I think, our steepest target at any significant distance, say 300 yards, was about a 30% incline or decline, depending on where you were. So you really don't have to worry about a 45 degree angle shot. Uh, I've never come across one of those even when I was mountain goat hunting. So, but it's good to know this stuff if you really want to get into the angled shooting. My easy answer is don't worry about it until the distance is more than 200 yards and the angle is more than 25, maybe 30 degrees. Otherwise, you're still going to stay on your target. 
My answer in the field uh, for a quick one is just if it's a steep angle, if it feels really steep to me and fairly far away, I just aim on the animal, but the lower part of the vital zone. So on the brisket or a little bit up from the brisket. Um, and that's for uphill or downhill. But thanks for bringing that up, Bob. Um, someday I'll do a video and after I do a little more research on all these cosines and stuff and I hone my math. But it is a fascinating subject. And it's one that you can play around with if you're in mountain country out of shooting range that extends out there pretty far. All right. This is a South Movie. Sir, I'm from India. Can you please share some idea which rifle is better, a Winchester Model 70 in 375 H&H Magnum or a Wesley Richard 375 Magnum? And I assume that's a H and H too. Thank you. Hmm. I've never owned a Wesley Richards, <laughs> probably because they're a little bit too pricey for my budget. So I suspect that the Wesley Richards uh, bold action rifle is going to be a little higher quality. I don't know that it's going to shoot any better than the Winchester or be any more durable. Uh, the Winchester Model 70 is a classic rugged, durable, controlled round feed action that's beloved around the world, especially by dangerous game hunters who really like that Mauser style extractor spring on the outside of the bolt. Um, and it should work beautifully for you if, if everything is built properly, tuned properly, and they usually are. And Wesley Richards is more of a custom manufacturer, and they really try to make things just perfect, polished, and it's absolutely the best they can for a pretty good price. I don't think you could go wrong with either one, so probably judge that one based on your budget. All right, now here's another correction. This is from Dean Out. Correction, 300 below cryogenic treating in Decatur, Illinois will de-stress your barrel and it usually improves groups by 50% in my experience. Whoa. So that was um, a correction of mine, I think, when I was discussing cryogenetics, freezing your barrel to take stresses out of them so they shoot more accurately when they're cool as well as ones you've shot several times and the barrel has gotten hotter. That's when you usually start to see your, your shots starting to wander or drift because of some stresses in the metal. Those stresses change with the temperatures. So uh, cryogenetic treatment is a common way. Well, not all that common, but a fairly well-known way and effective way of straightening that stuff out. Something about that deep freeze gets all of the different stresses in the grain structure of the steel to even out, and you end up with a more consistent barrel. So that's what Dean has discovered with his uh, personal experience. And we appreciate that, Dean. Now, here is one from Paul regarding what I've said about bear attacks and which ammunition to choose and use in case you think you might have to defend yourself from a raging, rampaging grizzly or brown bear. Paul says, I've been charged by a grizzly bear and uh, he had mistaken me for an elk because I was calling. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it here, boy. <laughs> So he shot him, he said. Paul says, I shot him at 20 yards under a full charge. Headshot him with a 300 Winchester short magnum and a Barnes bullet. That's an all copper bullet that got deep penetration. Probably a good one to use in this case. Paul said the bear vanished and silent, went silent, as did me and my partner. It sounds like they just sat there and waited. After a half hour of silence, we decided to move. They weren't going to tempt that bear in case he was still alive, I guess. Well, as soon as I stood up and I stepped on a stick, the bear growled from out of sight somewhere. Long story short, horsepower isn't a bad thing in grizzly country. If I'd had my little 6.5 millimeter, I may have gotten chewed on that day. Well, you may have or maybe not. It depends on the bullet and where you put it, of course. The idea, and I think this is what I brought up in that podcast that you'd heard about which bullets to use and everything for bears. Obviously, we all know bigger is better when it comes to stopping a charge. I always maintain there is no such thing as a stopping rifle or a stopping cartridge because I've heard way too many horror stories from PHs over in Africa who have shot with so-called massive stopping rifles, 458 lots, seven, uh, 470 Nitro Express, 500 Nitro Express, 505 Gibbs, throwing 400 to 500 grain bullets, and they will hit a charging buffalo once, twice, three times, four times. I've heard as many as eight times without stopping it. Certainly, they're killing it, but as we all know, heart and lung shots 
takes a while for that animal to die. And when the adrenaline is up, they can really keep going. So the brain shot right here that you did with your 300 WSM, that headshot, that's definitely the way to go. But remember on a bear, especially a really big, tough grizzly bear and or brown bear, their heads are so hard. There's so much muscle overlaying them. And then you've got that sloped angle. A lot of bullets can skip right off of that. Uh, having a solid would be the way to go. But then if you have to end up with a chest shot, the solid's not going to do as much terminal tissue damage. So it's always a compromise. And I commend you for that Barnes bullet because that is one that is going to expand and would do a lot of tissue damage in the chest shot. But at the same time, it retains almost all of its mass because generally those pedals that expand are all copper, one piece with the bullet, and unless you just shear a bone just right, they won't break off. And that bullet will keep penetrating. And even if they do break off, the bulk of the bullet is still there to maintain momentum and keep penetrating. So you can do the same thing with lighter bullets. And this was proven 100 years ago or more by Bell. I keep going back to him in Africa because he was a commercial ivory hunter and he used really small bullets, mostly the 757 Mauser with 173 grain bullet, I believe, but also a 6.5 man liquor with, uh, I think, 156 grain bullet. And he was able to penetrate through the bone of the skull of an elephant pretty routinely with those bullets. But he did notice that the skinnier 6.5 millimeters started to bend sometime. So there was an issue with that. So I, that suggests to me that a 6.5 of the proper construction could penetrate the skull of a grizzly bear just as well as an elephant, probably better. So regardless what you are shooting, go with a heavier bullet, go with a more solidly constructed controlled expansion bullet, because you don't want that bullet breaking up on a big animal, where, regardless where you have to shoot him. But an even smarter answer, of course, is the one that Paul is recommending, which is to use a pretty big cartridge. So a lot of moose hunters would say, yeah, I know I can take them with a 6.5 or a 270. But since I'm in bear country, I think I'll take a 338 Magnum or a 375 Magnum or something that makes me feel a little safer and more confident in case Mr. Grizzly comes for a visit. All right. Those are the ones we had written down. Now the team has given me the digital version here. And let's see what they've come up with. Here is a question from Hoosier. For varmint hunting and for whitetails, which is better? Oh, so we've got a combo here. A dual purpose cartridge, the new 6.5 Creedmoor or the 243 Winchester? Mmm. Good one. You know, I, I wouldn't say it's quite a toss up, but here's how I would spin it for my personal uses. And this is based on personal experience over a long time. I would go 243 if it was mainly for hunting coyotes um, and other uh, fur bearers like that. Um, and I'd go with the six point Creedmoor if I was mostly going to be hunting deer and pronghorn and maybe elk and only occasionally going for the fur. Um, but even better yet, if you really want to specialize in a fur cartridge, I would step down to the 22 calibers, 223, 22, 250, somewhere in that range, or the new um, 22 Creedmoor if they've come out with it. I think they still have not made that a commercial round, but I, it's got to be on the drawing boards here pretty quickly because it just makes for uh, an improved 22, 250. But you can also step down to the 20s, like a 204 Ruger. I think that's great for varmints, for fur, really saves the pelts and makes for some beautiful clothing. But the 6.5 Creedmoor will certainly do the job. A little bit heavier bullets. You can step down to the 123 grains or up to the 140, 243 grains for the bigger stuff. And yeah, it's quite versatile. 243 Winchester will shoot a little flatter. Uh, in case you have to do any long range work, but the 6.5 Creedmoor with the longer bullets at the higher BCs will deflect less in the wind. So, yep, it's a, uh, you're not going wrong with either one of those, but it is kind of a tough choice to make. Hey, why not get one of each? <laughs> All right. Good question. This is from Charlie and Charlie asks, Hey Ron, what are your thoughts about the new Remington Corlock tipped 30 at six ammunition? Um, I haven't thought too much about it at all, but then I've been familiar with core-locked uh, ammunition for a long, long time. And all they did was put a 
polymer tip on it. Um, I've got some bullets here with polymer tips. I think you can see those if you're watching this on YouTube rather than listening on your pod catchers. But polymer tips on bullets are not all that big of a deal, not all that special. They don't really do a lot uh, other than I always call it sex appeal or sales appeal. They look really cool. Now, because they are so sharp, they do improve the ballistics coefficient a, a bit, but that's more determined by the ogive of the bullet and the boat tail style on it. So essentially with these core locked tipped bullets, all you're doing is having your traditional core locked bullet, which is a glorified, slightly glorified cup and core bullet, meaning you've got your gilding metal cup or tube drawn out to length. You put a lead cable inside of it and you squeeze it into the bullet shape. That's your typical cup and core bullet. What core lock did was they put a little bit of a, a rim of gilding metal inside to help hold the cable. And I don't know if they do that by pouring molten lead in or not. I kind of suspect they would have to. At any rate, I've used those bullets with many different cartridges and rifles over the years and found that the performance was not all that different from typical cup and core bullets, like the standard core lock. Um, uh, or the standard, let's say, the Federal um, Soft Point or Winchester Power, but all, all the old ones that were just cup and core bullets. You're not going to get a lot of improvement, but they're really accurate. Almost all of those older bullets were really accurate because they're fairly soft and they obdurate. They obdurate to fill your barrel precisely and follow the rifling, and they they're just well-balanced and stabilized, and they're darn effective on broadside shots on deer. And that's what most people use them for. So I would not hesitate to use that cartridge for whitetail sized animals. Stepping up to an elk, if I were using that bullet, I would definitely go with the heavier weights, 180 and up, just because that always helps with a little more weight retention in that bullet. Fairly soft bullets like that want to break up. They just tend to break up, especially if they hit bones. So that's what I would be concerned about. But other than that, and they hit soft tissue, they mushroom very well, expand very well. And of course, that helps damage more tissue as you that bullet moves through the animal. Hi, guys. Say, do you enjoy my videos? Well, if you do, I've got some good news for you and some perks. If you join me on Patreon, you get early access to those videos and you get a newsletter with inside information of what's going on or has recently gone on around here at Ron Spomer Outdoors. And uh, of course, you get a uh, 15% discount on the Ron Spomer Outdoors store. So uh, you might want to check it out. Patreon, we really appreciate all, all of the patrons on Patreon who help us produce this content. We'd love to have you join us. All right, Steve's question. In all my years of hunting, I've never used a scope. Why should I start? You shouldn't. <laughs> I mean, if you're happy with what you're doing, why mess around with what works? But if you do want to take advantage of your cartridge's potential for longer shots, I think you would benefit from using a scope simply because it makes it a lot easier to precisely aim on your target. A lot of People with really good eyes and a lot of practice and experience can shoot remarkably well at distance with open sights, but it is just a lot easier with a scope, especially as you start aging and your eyes don't quite work as well as they did when you were 22. <laughs> um, it's difficult to focus on a rear sight a front sight, and then an animal 100 or 300 yards away because your eye just can't do that. You can only focus to one point, and that rear sight is a lot closer to your eye than the front sight, and that's a lot closer to your eye than the game animal. So you usually say, focus on that front sight. Line everything up on the animal and then sharpen your focus on the post, the front sight, and let the rear sight sort of go fuzzy and the animal go fuzzy. And that's the key to success with open sights. And you probably know that if you've been hunting successfully with it all these years. So if you're happy, no, you don't need a scope. But another good reason to use a scope is to make sure of your target. Having that target, even at 100 yards, magnified four times, like a 4X scope would do for you, or six times or more, might save you from making a mistake like there's a limb between 
the animal and to me, and I'm probably going to hit it. and It'll deflect my shot. Or, ooh, I think I see the back line of a smaller animal standing in front of it, and I might hit that. Or I thought that was a two-point buck, and I see now that it's just the white edge of that mule deer's ear. It's a doe. You don't want to shoot that. So you can get in trouble. Now, this does not mean I advocate using a rifle scope for glassing game. I'm definitely against that. It is not safe. I've been afield and I've seen someone out there aiming a rifle at me. I put my binocular up and the guy is looking at me with his scope. And when I accosted him and asked him why the heck he was aiming his rifle at me, he said, oh, I was just glassing for game. And I thought you might be a deer. Talk about scare the bejesus out of you. (laughs) So I don't want to see that ever again. I don't think anyone else does. I think it is really dangerous to be pointing a loaded rifle at someone just so you can use your scope like a binocular. And besides, a scope doesn't work as well as a binocular anyway. With a binocular, you have binocular vision, two stereoscopic vision. You can see depth. You can see more. Scope is for aiming precisely, not for picking out game. End of sermon, but I think it was worth delivering. All right, Steve, good question. Hey, good luck whether you start with a scope or not. It's always really up to you. This is Reload North, and Reload North asks, Hey, I just traded an older Savage Axis in 308 Winchester for a Parker Hale in 300 Win Mag. I will be using it for this year's moose hunt. That's a good one. Do you have any knowledge or experience or comments to make on the Parker Hale rifles? Thank you. Keep up the great videos. Thank you, Reload. All right. Parker Hale was an English gun and ammo manufacturer. I think they made knives and a bunch of other stuff too, but they were a manufacturer involved oh, from roughly 1900 through the 1980s, I think. Um, I remember in the 1960s and 70s, they were fairly popular rifles. A friend of mine had one, and it was built on a Mauser action. So that is kind of your classic controlled round feed action with the spring external on the, on the bolt body. And really pull those cartridges out of the chambers pretty reliably, and it held them against the face of the bolt. It was a pretty heavy rifle, as I recall, and... During that era, they built them with some pretty rakish lines, sort of the Weatherby style, the California style. They'd have rollover cheek pieces on them, which helped with recoil control. Uh, Monte Carlo stocks, uh, rakish forends instead of rounded. So they were fairly distinctive. And sometimes they would make them, I think, out of maple. I remember some blonde ones. And I'm guessing these were the model... 1200, 1200 was the model number on that, if I remember. But they also made rifles earlier, I think on the Lee Enfield action. I think they were building rifles for the uh, military during World War II uh, and maybe World War I as well. And I've heard they had some other models and, and actions back in the day. So I'm not sure which one you have there, Patrick, but I'm guessing it was one of the modern ones from the 60s, 70s, or 80s. I think they... They sold out in the 90s, the early 90s, I think, and they got incorporated into another manufacturer's line or something. So I don't see them anymore. Parker Hale certainly doesn't stamp them Parker Hale or make them over in England anymore. But they're a pretty good rifle, um, as you should expect from a good Mauser action like that. Uh, They just put a stock on it, put a barrel on it. As long as they're using good barrels, You've got yourself a Mauser-style rifle that could be pretty darn accurate. I know my friend's was. He had his in a 25 mot 6 So um, I think you're going to do just fine with that. If it shoots well for you, functions well, you got a 300 Win Mag, Moose isn't going to like that. You just might. All right. This is a question from Patrick, and he asks, does it bother you that the newer bullet and gun models are designed for precision shooters and not hunters? <laughs> That's an interesting question, Patrick. I will say... No, it doesn't bother me because I think hunters still have plenty of great rifles from which to choose. It just, I think, adds to riflery. Um, I think it's good because more people get interested in shooting and more people develop good shooting skills. And I think it's as important to know how to shoot well as it is to know how to do basic carpentry electric work, plumbing work, just life skills. Um, And I know a lot of people think a life skill is not 
shooting a firearm or a bow or even a slingshot. But throughout human history, I think we have learned that those basic tools that we invented serve a darn good purpose. They keep us alive and they provide food for us. And of course, in safe times, they're just plain fun to develop hand-eye coordination skills. If you enjoy hitting a badminton or tennis ball or golf ball or throwing a football or any other hand-eye coordination sport of throwing things, that's just what the human animal does. We are a tool maker and we have made some wonderful tools that we now call rifles and shotguns. And I think it's good to learn how to use those and use those properly and safely, of course which the vast, vast, vast majority of riflemen do. So, no, having a precision rifle for target shooting doesn't bother me at all. Um, I am a little bit bothered by people who use them for hunting, but, hey, it's their style. It's their hunt. You know, just because I like a six-pound rifle, ultralight, so I don't have to carry a lot of weight up the mountains, and I find those effective, doesn't mean that somebody else has to like it. He might prefer a 10-pound rifle because... For him, it's more accurate. For him, it doesn't recoil as much, and he just plain likes it, or she. So just gives us more choices. And the ammunition, I don't have a problem with that either because, once again, it's more efficiency. We don't have to buy the new cartridges and the new bullets that are longer and heavier uh, and deflect less in the wind. But if we want to, they're out there. So why not? So, yeah, that's my take on it. It just gives us more options. All right. This is QD. QD says, hey, I'm just curious. What is the difference between a rolling block and a falling block? Ah, this is an unusual question. Are those just different names for the same mechanism? No, not at all. They're completely different. They both load singly from the breech. But a falling block, you pull that lever down and the block, a solid block of steel, drops vertically or almost perfectly vertically below the breech to expose it. You drop your round in, you close your bolt, and that big block slides up and seals it beautifully. Extremely strong. Takes really high pressure cartridges. Now, the rolling block, an earlier design, was extremely popular from about 1870s into the 1890s. The Remington rolling block is the most famous one. It's the only one I know of. There may have been others, but that one was fairly weak. Because you had a hammer on the back, you pulled back, and then the block itself actually rotated back. So it could not hold as much pressure. Took low pressure cartridges, not high pressure. So check it out. You should be able to find some YouTubes that dis- demonstrate how those work. I do not have a rolling block. Even if I were doing this on my regular YouTube channel where I could show that kind of stuff, I wouldn't have one to show you. <laughs> But they're definitely different, and I think the falling block is vastly superior. All right, this is our last question. Michael, Michael asks, for Africa Hunts, I know that you have mentioned Book My Hunt before. Are all of the outfitters on that site going to be honest and moral about how game is taken? I don't want to make a mistake with a dishonest or immoral outfitter. Another question, I know there's a lottery system as well as point system here in the U.S. for getting tags. How does it work over there or in other countries? Who? Two big questions. First of all, Book My Hunt has a pretty good reputation. I used their service once before. We had a great time. It was everything advertised. They claim that they really check these outfitters out before they work with them and book with them. So I I can't promise you anything on this. This, My experience was a one-off, but I've heard good things. But then again, you hear good things from one person on one outfitter, and then you hear bad things with the same outfitter from somebody else. It's really hard to predict, but I have seen no indication or heard any rumors that outfitters on Book My Hunt are any different from outfitters with any other booking service. The difference, of course, is that Book My Hunt is all done online. You don't have to get a hold of an actual booking agent and visit with them about things. So that's probably what prompted your question because you really don't have that personal interaction. But the idea with Book My Hunt is that they do the personal interaction. They interview the outfitters. They go there. They check their camps out and that sort of thing. They vet them. And then if that measures up to their standards, they will book that hunt. (laughs) And so you book it online and you save a little bit of money because you skip the middleman, so to speak. Now, your next question about um, how does it work over there with tags and that sort of thing? Well, 
in most countries, who knows? Every country is a little bit different, I suspect. But it struck me all the times that I've hunted overseas, and this includes New Zealand, Australia, Argentina, five different countries in Africa, uh, Scotland, all these places. It just seemed to me that it was pretty simple. I booked a hunt with an outfitter and everything was taken care of. I didn't even really see the licenses most time. I think a few times they handed me the paperwork. I signed a license of some kind, but mostly it's between them and the government. And then they are the agent who take care of all this stuff, tags and licenses. Um, basically, you say, hey, I want to come over there and hunt a red stag and maybe get some feral hogs, maybe shoot some birds. What do we do? Well, I'm going to charge you $3,000 a minute. <laughs> you come over and I'll feed you and give you a nice place to stay, guide you, take you to all the game you want to shoot, and, and all the costs are covered. Your licenses, your tags, your fees, I'll do that work for you. Now, I do know that in most African countries, private landowners own the game on their land. This applies to Namibia and South Africa for sure. So they can charge anything they want. They can let you shoot one or two or ten. It's theirs. It's just like livestock. And the reason it works so well over there is because that wildlife now has value, like livestock would, their cattle or their sheep or something. They have a reason to have wildlife on their property. In the old days, the pioneers wiped out all the black wildebeest and the springbuck and everything else. So they had more forage for their cattle because the cattle brought them money and the game didn't. Now it's kind of reversed itself in a lot of places. So you have got a lot of competition on a lot of farms that have a lot of wildlife and the prices are fairly low and you don't have to buy a license or a tag. You just go there and say, I think I'd like to shoot that Oryx. And he says, oh, go ahead. It'll cost you $2,000 or whatever he wants for his price. And you decide and you've just bought your tag. <laughs> so it's pretty simple. But it, again, in other countries, just ask your outfitter because that's generally the way it works. You are able to go over there hunting because the outfitter has an allocation of so many tags for so many kinds of species and whatnot all. And, and if he doesn't have it, let's say you wanted to get a sable and he said, gosh, I'm sorry, but I had 10 sable in my hunting block as an allocation from the government and I've already filled those. I have hunters coming over for sable, so I don't have any sable tags, but I can let you hunt a kudu. So that's how you figure that stuff out. That's the way it works. No point system. It's a lot simpler. Okay, those are the questions for today. And there were a lot of them and there were some good ones um, and thoughtful ones. I hope I got all my information correct. If I don't have it right, you guys straighten me out. As always, we're depending on you to keep me honest and shooting straight. This is Ron Spomer. See you next time. <music>